hey, we're live now. And but usually what I'll do is I'll wait a few minutes because it takes a while for people to join. Okay. And I'll see there are comments that people are leaving and I can see the comments, but I'll read you some if they pop up. Okay. If anybody has questions or anything. Okay. Um, but yeah, I want to wait till I have at least one person watching. <laughs> <laughs> that'd be good it would be good the thing that's cool though is people can watch this after uh you know when it's recorded so right which is really what i expect people to do is watch on their own time so um but yeah basil is hanging out in prince edward county at an undisclosed location because his <laughs> life is, he's got bodyguards outside of this location. So don't even try to find him. You'll he's never doing, find me. Never, ever. He's so unapproachable. There's like a moat on the outside, alligators in the moat, and then like <laughs> armed guards. And if you, if you step towards him, one time I tried to step towards Basil and like 10 dudes with sunglasses pushed me away. And I said, look, I'm just trying to tell him what songs we're going to sing tonight. So, okay. So maybe I'm going to start because we have a few people watching. So, um, all right. And uh, so, yeah, welcome to the third episode of The Making of Sleepy Little Sailor. My wonderful guest tonight is Basil Donovan, who, of course, is most famous for being the bass player in Canadian Roots Royal Royalty band um blue rodeo and as he's probably heard a million times because he's told this story to me it all began in 1984 when basil answered the famous now magazine ad that read if you've dropped acid at least 20 times lost three or four years to booze are looking good and can still manage to keep time call jim or greg so after 36 years many hit songs juno awards days on the road blue Ro Blue Rodeo is still going strong today. But, but what I find amazing is before Blue Rodeo, Basil had been playing professionally for, what, 12 years already. And he was touring in country bands, prog bands, new wave bands. He hung out on Young Street, saw the band, the Stones, and countless other groups that are now famous or forgotten. I really think he needs to write a memoir Maybe that's what we should do together, actually, Basil. You could talk, tell stories, and I'll type it all out for you. That because, sounds good. Yeah, he's witnessed, basically he's witnessed firsthand the Toronto music scene for the last 50 years. How is this possible? Uh, Basil comes from a musical Nova Scotia family. His parents moved to Toronto when he was a baby. And his family settled in the western part of the city called The Junction where several train lines meet and is now a hipster neighborhood, which I lived in up until very recently. Um, it still has the feel of a little gritty town on the edge of industrial lands in spite of its hipsterdom. And many years ago when I moved to the junction, Basil told me some stories about his rough and tumble uncles who lived in a house at Dundas West and Keel, just at the place where the road curves left. Speeding drivers would miss the turn of the road and crash into the house. Luckily, no one was seriously injured. At least I don't think so. There are now guardrails protecting the house. So if you guys <laughs> want to go and check it out, you can see. Uh, at, it's Keel, right? No, wait. It's on it's Annette right, Street. It's on Annette. Oh, yeah, right. I'm getting mixed up. I've already lost my bearings because I've, I've been in Vancouver too long now. It's on a net street, and you can see the guardrails. It's quite hilarious. Um, so, Basil, tell me about that house and who lived there. Well, I lived lived there with my parents and my uncles. It was a, it's a very big house, and my uncles and one of my aunts rent would were all coming from Nova Scotia at the time because my mother was the uh, second oldest in the family. There, she had one older brother. So my mother settled in Toronto and then one by one, her sister came and then her, her uh, other four brothers decided that they were coming up to live in Toronto. 
So as they arrived, they would live with us. Only they would rent like rooms on the top floor. Uh, like there was three floors in the house. So anyway, it was, on weekends, it was party central, right? Because they all played <laughs> guitar and they were, they were in their teens. They were like 17, oh 18, God. 21, 22, you know. I think my mother being, you know, the oldest, uh, when, I, when around that time, I was probably about seven. Mm-hmm. So my mother would have been only 20, 24 at that time. Oh, man. Right? And, and uh, so with the uncles, like what year is it? Is it early 60s? This is, yeah, right around the time the Beatles broke, like 1964, 63. Uh, I remember watching the Beatles on Ed Sullivan on that TV, like in that house. Mm. And then that was the be- beginning. Soon as, The next day was the world was different. You know what I mean? It's like the Beatles were on Ed Sullivan. And within the next week, everybody that I, you know, went to school with was singing uh, I want to hold your hand and she loves you. And, and uh, we were all Beatle crazy at that point. And you and we all 10? wanted to be the Beatles. <laughs> yeah. Well that, yeah. Tell me about that. So like your uncles, were they into that too? When they played guitar? No, were they, they were into, into Elvis. Oh, they were into Elvis. So they were like, they were Elvis music. and Chuck Berry. And like, they, they like the old Jerry Lee Lewis uh, all the old rock and roll from the fifties that my, my one uncle sang bebop a one song I'll never forget him singing. And he sang it at every party and everyone would get up and dance, you know, in the kitchen and, and in the living room and that. Uh, and he, you know, then my other uncle was more into like the old time country music mm. and they all picked and they would play with each other. But when it came time for each one of them to sing a song, they had, really distinct styles because mm. my youngest uncle whose name was Herman they called him Hermie he was really into all of the uh rockabilly rock and roll like rock around the clock and uh buddy especially buddy holly he loved buddy holly and then my other uncle would sing all of these old country songs mm-hmm. and then i had the other uncle who was more traditional he was kind of more into the cape breton music mm-hmm. that that was their roots, right? But they could all play with each other, you know? So it was always fun at the parties because they, I saw at the parties, I saw them get all the attention. (laughs) That's pretty cool. (laughs) Is that what motivated you actually? I mean, so did you like the music that they liked or were you trying to get away from it and get into the beat, you know, the Beatles being the inspiration? I liked it all. You liked it all. Yeah. I remember my uncle, playing me before even before the Beatles I remember him playing me that Johnny Cash song don't take your love to town mm-hmm. which actually you too I think did a cover of uh, anyway I love that song and that was that was before the Beatles that would be I would be in grade one at that time I was probably about six and that was before the Beatles happened and it almost seems unreal now to be in a world before the Beatles happened, you know, like where there was no Beatles, you know what I, I mean? Know that, especially for you, because it feels like to me that even though you're really rooted in country music and other, lots of other, you know, rockabilly and that kind of thing and Blue Rodeo being a blend of all kinds of music, it to me, it feels like the Beatles are one of the biggest influences on you. I don't know if you would agree. Would you Absolutely. agree with that? Absolutely. Without a doubt. They're, they were the reason that, I, you know, I mean, my uncles were a big influence because it was right there in front of me in my house mm-hmm. live. So that was a big influence just to see them doing what they did, you know, and like I'd be asleep on a Friday night and the bar would close and then all of a sudden there'd be a party downstairs right. and I'd sneak down the stairs to watch, you know, oh, fun. And then sooner or later, I would just be, you know, sitting on the sidelines watching the whole thing, right? So that was a big influence. But the thing that when the Beatles broke, it 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 was all across, you know, society. Like it was it was not just in my house. It was like everywhere. You know, mm-hmm. you went out on the street, and there was like kids were coming to school with Beatle lunch pails. You know what I mean? Wow. So it was everywhere, and it was on TV all the time. 
Screaming Girls, Beatlemania was in the news all the time. So that, you know, had a big, big effect on, you know, I, I got a guitar, mm-hmm. started, tried well, to learn how to play. That's what I was going to ask you, like, when, when did that, who gave you the guitar? Or how did you get that guitar? Well, there was always a guitar in the house because of my uncles. Mm-hmm. But my father saw that I really dug it and he went out and bought me my own guitar. I remember it was like a red sparkly Kent guitar, right? Cool. And the action was so high, there's no way I was ever going to play it. <laughs> but it looked good when I put it on and stood in front of the mirror, right? Yeah, yeah. So so I got that part of it down. I got a few moves down back then, you know, like, hey, it looks good like this, you know? Oh, my God. But it was, hilarious. you know, it wasn't until years later where I, you know, I got a guitar that I could actually play. You know, and my mm-hmm. uncle started showing me, my, my youngest uncle, Hermie, he started showing me some chords and he showed me this thing called the Guitar Boogie Shuffle, which was basically, you know, over yeah. and over in the key of E and you just play two strings. So I, you know, I learned that when I was about eight or nine, right? And that, then I was off to the races. Once I could play something, any like anything at all, Mm-hmm. I felt like, hey, I can do this, you know. I love that. You and didn't have I, any doubts. No, no. Then at that point, I was, I just, I knew that I loved it. I just thought, mm-hmm. this is great. This, because just doing that, I think it, re, it made me realize, and I feel this today about music, how it lifts my spirits. Mm. Like, no matter what I'm doing or how I'm feeling, you know, like I could be in a big argument at home and I yeah. go into the other room and I pick up my guitar and it calms me down. Mm. You know, uh, if I if I feel like I'm, you know, a little in a slump, but I pick mm-hmm. up the guitar, I have all of a sudden feel better. Mm-hmm. I start playing and I think like, ah, oh, life's not so bad, you know, like, you know what I mean? It's so yeah. I... The, mu- the part of music being good for the soul mm-hmm. kind of hit me right away that, mm. you know, I didn't know that's what I was thinking. But I remember, you know, when I'd play those little things that I knew, I felt good. I felt like, yeah, yeah you know, this is this is worth doing. Right. Yeah. It can change the way your brain feels. It really does. It uh, also takes part of your brain out of out of the present. You know, mm-hmm. it puts you, I don't know, to me, it takes me to another place the, where I feel a comfort. Mm. That's cool. And when you listened to music, when you were sitting on the stairs listening to your uncles, did you feel that same thing or were you just kind of watching and observing? Oh, yeah. No, I, I, I had all the favorite songs and I, there's songs I, you know, I even like asked my uncle to play a certain song or, you know, play that one again, you know, like, mm-hmm. like kids do. Yeah, you, know, you get onto a song and you go play that one again. You know, rock around the clock. I like that one. Yeah, play that one again, right? And he would, uh, you know, because it was at a party and everybody was drinking, and you know, they didn't care what they <laughs> lots were of drinking. To. Yeah, <laughs> East Coast kitchen parties, you know. Yeah. Um. Well, it's interesting that you learn that boogie on the guitar because that is really like a bass line. I mean, it how is. Did you, how did you switch? Like, when did you go to bass and why? Well, I it was probably about, I was about 14, I think. And I was playing with this, I met this fellow named Andre, who was really talented. He was the same age, he was actually a year younger than me, but he had been playing accordion. He's Italian. Mm-hmm. He had been playing accordion since he was six. And he could play really well. Plus, he he had he got this Fender Stratocaster guitar, and he had a Fender amp. And one day, I went over to his place, and he he just picked up his guitar and started playing Jimi Hendrix, note for note. Wow! And I just was kind of like, wow, because Hendrix had just come out, right? There, I think the only album was Are You Experienced, hmm. and he could play like you know, Hey Joe, perfectly, right? And mm-hmm. yeah, Purple Haze. And I was like, 
oh man, this guy's really good. So when I, before I left, he said, well, do you want to get a band? And I said, yeah, right away, without hesitation. Well, we started the band. We knew a drummer who lived around the corner. So we started our band, but we could never find a really good bass player. Every time we'd have a bass player, something, you know, it didn't work out. It was usually our, it was one of my best friends was playing bass and he couldn't really play. He, you know, we just kind of said one day, you should buy a bass and be our bass player, right? Well, it didn't work out. So we ended up getting this guy who was in the neighborhood and he was about three or four years older than us. And he had a, a day job. He had just left school and had a day job. And uh, anyway, he had a really nice bass and a really nice amp. And he used to leave it at the rehearsal space. And, but he didn't get off work until six in the evening. So he wouldn't arrive to at, like it'd be eight o'clock before he got to rehearsal. Mm -hmm. And we'd go there right after school. So, so you had been the there time for like arrived, four hours. <laughs> yeah, I, I'd have been playing bass for four hours. Oh, wow. And then he'd come in and I'd switch back to guitar. And then one day the guitar player, just Andre, just said to me, you know, we'd be a lot better band if you played bass, right? <laughs> And I kind of went, yeah, I know. He <laughs> said, you should get a bass. <laughs> so you were so actually I, playing the bass for the other guy before the other guy showed up. That's really funny. Yeah, well, because we knew, we were learning all these songs, and it, a lot of them were Beatles songs, and they had nice bass lines. And so, you know, we would listen to them. We would le learn them right there in the rehearsal space. Mm -hmm. So I would lift all these bass lines and play them. And then I knew them. I knew how to play them better than our bass player did, hmm. right? You know, because right. we were all, we were pretty young at the time. So the band would be sounding pretty good between four and eight o'clock. And then <laughs> when he arrived, it was like we were starting over again. Oh, boy. that's So funny. we ended up kind of just telling him it wasn't working out. He took his amp and then, you know, we struggled to get another amp. We rented one and I, I bought a bass. I traded in one of my guitars and bought a bass. And what I was, I guess I was about 16 at that point where yeah. I just decided bass was my instrument. You know, it was, that's what it was going to be. Did I didn't stop playing bass? guitar. No, no. At first I got a Vox bass, you know, like the Vox amps. Yeah. And it had a built-in switch that turned it into a fuzz tone. Oh, wow. Which really made it sound like Black Sabbath. And it was great, <laughs> right? Because it was like... <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome and it had a much smaller fretboard which made it not that much different than the guitar right and you know it was it was years later it wasn't until i really until i joined the sharks where i decided mm -hmm. to play a precision because you know i i had been playing a rickenbacker after that because i was mm -hmm. a big yes fan when i was in high school i right you know i really liked Chris Squire. I thought he was the greatest bass player. Him and McCartney were my two big influences and they both played mm -hmm. Rickenbacker. So I bought a Rickenbacker and I played that for a long time. And then uh, it was when I joined the Sharks that I, I actually borrowed a Fender Precision from my friend Andre. Oh, the same and guy. Yeah, because he played a bit of, he, he's actually still plays bass for a living. Like he's out oh, cool. in, you know, he plays in bars and that he's never stopped playing. In fact, he went, he went into computers for years and it didn't work out. Right. Hmm. He like, he got laid off or he lost a contract and he went back mm -hmm. to gigging. <laughs> wow. Cause he's, he's such a good musician that he should be playing music, you know? Yeah. So yeah, I still talk to him every now and then. And you know, he, he had a big influence on me because he, he taught me theory. And if it wasn't for that, he taught it to me the way a 17 year old can teach another 17 year old. Hmm. You know what I mean? Instead yeah. of a classroom setting, like with a teacher, you know, who's in his thirties or something like that, teaching it to you. He just sat down and showed me as friends while we were smoking a joint. You know what I mean? I love that. Yeah. So it just made it easier to learn, right? As, right. Because you, did, you didn't have a teacher in that way. I mean, you had many people teaching you things probably, but you, did you ever have a teacher like, you know, the school mom teacher trying to make you practice and all that stuff? Did you have that? No, not really. I, I had 
like in high school, I was in the high school band. Mm -hmm. So we had music teachers at the school, but you know, that was an hour a day. I played the bassoon, right? Mm -hmm. In the high, in the orchestra. So I, I knew how to read music and, you know, I could ask my teachers questions about things. Like there was two, two different teachers who were pretty cool. And I would ask sometimes I took advanced theory after my friend Andre showed me enough stuff. I started taking their, they offered this advanced theory class where you had to stay after school, which wasn't that cool, but because it was music theory, I did. So I learned a lot from that, but I didn't really have any formal teacher. Like I didn't, mm -hmm. you know, I didn't have lessons or anything like that. Mm -hmm. It was just picking it up by ear and, you know, just doing, uh, you know, learning song by song, basically. Someone, Someone wants to, to teach know me. if you can name your favorite Beatles song. Can oh, geez. you do that? That's really hard. I or don't think so. Just maybe one that you love so much. Well, Strawberry Fields Forever was one, mm. one that really always stuck with me. I mean, mm -hmm. they're all so great. You know, it's it's know. really hard to go. Like, you know, Golden Slumbers is another one yeah. that, you know, brings you like tears. The epic, like epic ones. Well, you know, I, I remember the first time I saw Paul McCartney live and he when he went into that whole Golden Slumbers ending. And this is never, you know, I'm not that emotional of a guy, but I was at the concert and I had tears in my eyes by the end of the song, you know, and I yeah. remember thinking, like, that's powerful. You know, mm -hmm. uh, so I'd have to, you know, I'd have to say that that one probably, you know, that's a big one for me because it ends with it's, the end, right? With right. end in the end, the love you take yeah, is equal take. to the love. The, the, yeah. the, the love, love you, you make, make is equal to the love you take. Mm. And, you know, it's such a very strong climactic song i think that mm -hmm. you know that that's one of those songs where you kind of go wow you know i always feel you know you, you being such a great writer you would know like that feeling of if you finish something like that you know you you know it's like paul simon says when he wrote bridge over troubled waters he said i knew this was better than all the other stuff that i'd ever written he <laughs> said i knew that that I, i'd up my game you know, and I, I would think that Paul probably must, you know, there'd be a sense of, wow, did I just do that? You know, it's one of those songs for me anyway, that I, I, I find it uh, very inspiring. Mm -hmm. It is really like reaching for something way more than just a pop song. Yeah, exactly. It's like trying to create a symphony or an epic story or sound uh, a piece of music that has different sections that go different places i mean um i love the i love that how much they changed in their 10 years or whatever it was like seven years that was, that was like a normal thing to be to go through this change and like from 61 to 69 mm -hmm. they went from a band that was playing Johnny Be Good cover, you know, you know what I mean? Like yeah. playing old rock and roll standards to having yeah. this catalog, you know, that changed the world, right? Yes, totally. And wrapped it up before the end of the decade. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's it's, it's kind of amazing. It is so you know, amazing. They, well, I think there's 320 odd songs that they wrote in, in that time. Mm -hmm. And... You know, they're not all great, but if you look at their, their the amount of hits that they had, it's, it's staggering, you know, like mm -hmm. totally. that they could just keep pouring. And they always had double-sided hits. No one's ever done that since. They'd put out two songs and they would both be hit singles. They would just, they would... It'd say on the charts, everyone else would have one song, and then it would be uh, Hey Jude and Revolution, you know, like 
the Beatles they were on record the 45 would be. or something and that yeah. the DJ would just And turn both it sides over. were a hit, right? <clears throat> That's great. Yeah. So, I mean, it's they did have two writers, so mm -hmm. you know. Well, that Baz, made it I want to I like I want to maybe because I feel like um I want to talk about your writing because fa you know, fast forward to the late 90s when I met you and um, you know you're in this band Blue Rodeo you're touring across the country in the bus and you have this little classical guitar and you're in the back lounge and you start making up these melodies I mean was that something you just started to do right before like I have no idea if you had been doing that all along or is that something you just started to do and then you happened to ask me to write some lyrics with to put together with those melodies what was the story there because those i mean that to me those songs the melodies that you gave me are very beatles inspired yeah well you know i i've always played i always had a classical like a nylon string guitar at home mm -hmm. like it's been something that i've always i bought one when i was young and i had it for the longest time and then I sold it and I didn't have one for quite a while. I went to a friend's house one night and he had one sitting there and the long and short of it was I picked it up and started playing it. And my girlfriend at the time didn't even know I played guitar. She thought I just played bass. So she bought it for me. She went, you should have one of these. You don't have a guitar. I said, no. And she had just had a student loan or something, right? So she bought the guitar <laughs> for me, gift. And I ended up paying her back about a year later. But uh, that guitar I still have. That's the one that has the Yo Susanna sticker on the headstock, right? <laughs> that's awesome. I've had it ever since. So that's the guitar that I always just sit at home and play. And, you know, I would take it on the road and just sit on the back of the bus and play it. But for years, I would learn how to play, like, bass lines and melodies of other songs, like I'd learned Beatles songs or whatever, like, you know, all sorts of different, you know, kind of songs that suited that kind of a guitar, mm -hmm. but just playing the melodies and then playing some bass lines to go on top of it at the same time. And it was, I think it was, you know, there was a certain point, I think when we were, I remember telling Greg, I said in New Orleans, I kind of said, you know, I played guitar for, for years, I said, but just recently, I've got all these melodies pouring out of my head and I've got to put them down because, you know, sometimes I'll write a melody and I'll think like, what song is that? Mm -hmm. And then I'll realize, well, it's yours because nobody, <laughs> nobody, you know, you play it for a bunch of people and they go, I don't know, it sounds like yours, right? <laughs> so I started to realize that I was writing my own pieces because I had gotten to that point and I always found that they would always come you know I mean my lifestyle at that time was stay up late uh you know I smoked quite a bit of weed at the time and just before I went to sleep mm -hmm. I would always grab the guitar and play it for about an hour and in that time I would end up having to stay up a little later because I'd be onto a melody that I wanted to finish. And I'd wake up the next day and the first thing I would do is grab the guitar to see if I remembered it. And if I remembered it, I had an, I had something. And if I didn't, well, I'd have to go, go looking again. Mm -hmm. But I started to remember them all. And this was, I guess we were doing the days in between at that time in, in New Orleans. And all of a sudden, I started to accumulate accumulate all of these pieces as I called them and I at, originally my idea was just just to make a guitar record where I just played these melodies mm -hmm. and and then you know then I started to realize well hey maybe these some of these songs has more potential than that maybe they could be you know uh somebody could put words to them so I made that phone call to you because I had just really met you around that time, right? Yeah, I know. It's kind That's of kind of when we met. And uh, and that one, that particular song, Sleepy Little Sailor, I remember when I wrote it, I thought, 
hey, this is a good one. Like this is, I I really felt like it had the potential to be more than just one of my guitar mel melodies. So I made that call. I phoned you and left it on your answering machine. And yeah, do you remember doing that? Oh, I remember very well because it was really kind of a joke, you know, I like if you had just not done anything, that would have been fine. You know, I mean, <laughs> I wasn't I wasn't expecting you to come back with a song so quickly, really, because did I do you know, it quickly? I was just I throwing really it out remember. there. Really. I mean, you know, it's like that whole thing you see, you throw something at the wall, sometimes it sticks. Well, that's yeah. what happened. I just kind of went like I remember liking it, playing it so much that I really liked it. And I thought, well. I'll just, you know, I'll phone Susie and, you know, play it for her. And you weren't home, so I just left it on your answering machine. And it was a last-minute decision to kind of go, I have got this melody. Have you any <laughs> words, you know? <laughs> I love that. I mean, uh, I, my one of my biggest regrets was that I moved, and so my phone got disconnected. and I Because I saved that message for probably five years. You know, every seven days or whatever you had to kind of resave your messages at that point. yes yes and i was the so old I'd done machines. it forever like for however many weeks that is you know i said save 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 and i kept worrying that i was going to press the wrong button one day and then i moved and i'm like oh no the message is gone <laughs> and i didn't rem think about it because i was moving packing all my stuff and of course. And then of course they disconnected and they reconnected my line and I had a totally different number. And I was like, oh my God. But I kind of love that it's gone because I can just, there's something beautiful about having it in my memory too. Yeah, and a lot of times the, the memory is, has a better recall of it than the real life. And yeah. If you had it there, it might be not as interesting. You know? Maybe not, yeah. That's true. It's interesting. But I remember the time. About... And I remember... Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I just remember being so excited when you came back with the words, you know, it was like, wow, that was, you know, because it was very, the turnover was really quick. I remember that you kind of called me the next day. Really? And you, In a day? A, maybe it was a day after or something. You said, God. Yeah, I think I've, I think I've got something, you know, and I was like, <laughs> really? <laughs> well, I remember being so moved because you had said to me in person, I or maybe on the phone, hey, I've been writing these melodies. Do you want to maybe write some lyrics? And I really didn't know what to expect. And then, you know, I'm like, what is Basil writing? Because I'm just thinking, oh, he's just playing bass lines or something. And so I really <laughs> had no clue. And so I get this message and it's just like, oh my God, because it's so vivid. Like for me, so much of my process is listening to the melody and seeing what I what it conjures up in my mind, especially at that time. That was really how I worked. And right away, the word sleepy little sailor popped into my mind. Because right. it goes with that little where it is in the song, like sleepy little sailor, like that. That's yes. how you wrote the melody. And so I don't know. I mean, I think I was a little actually smarter then because I had just got <laughs> out don't... of school. <laughs> I, I was reading a lot of interesting books. My language skills felt a lot sharper. And oh, wow. so I think that I was, it was so great to, to take the inspiration from your music. And then also, I think I was watching your relationships because you were in one that was kind of falling apart. So I was like, okay, I'm going to think about that and write the story around this guy who's trying for trying to make it work but it's not happening and yeah. uh story so... of my life <laughs> story of everyone's <laughs> life <laughs> um so let me see i there are so many things i could ask you um 
what are the things that I wanted to say? Oh, yeah. Well, some people are asking some questions of you. First of all, you know, people joking about maybe you were loving the screaming girls instead of the music because of, and did you have a Beatles mop top <laughs> at the time? And then somebody was saying that, oh, they wanted to know what your top five venues to perform at in Ontario. You could answer that. I don't know. That's sort of... In hard. Ontario? I know you love Massey Hall probably, right? Yeah, Massey Hall would probably be my favorite venue. Yeah. Uh, just because, you know, that's where I went to see all of the people that I loved when oh, I was young. Wow. Who you did know? you see there? Oh, geez. The list is so long. You know, name uh, five people. Uh, Bob Dylan, mm -hmm. um, Paul Simon. Mm. Uh, I saw Tower of Power there, King Crimson several times. I was a big cool. prog rock fan at the time. Genesis with Peter Gabriel. Oh, wow. Which is still one of the most amazing shows I think I've ever seen in my life. It was their, I think it was their first show on their own the first time they headlined in toronto and i remember because gabriel had that big uh reverse mohawk like he had a big shave down the middle of his forehead and uh it, it was just a, that was an amazing show uh you know then i also saw lots of great country like merle haggard george jones you know uh, and they were at massey hall too. johnny winter when he was at his prime frank zappa and the mothers uh, oh cool you know the list it goes on and on you know i just saw ringo Starr. i think was one of the last shows that i saw there but uh yeah you know it's a place that i went to see everybody you know, in, in my youth, it was, you know, it was the place where everybody played, right? So, mm -hmm. in, you know, in my 20s, you know, I, I would go there and I remember when I first played there, we opened for Katie Lang on the first time I played there. I remember going and standing center stage and kind of, you know, just standing there and thinking of all the people that I saw standing in that spot, you know. So that would be probably my one, you know, the National Arts Center is another place that, you know, there's, it's not lost on me what, you know, kind of, it's a bit of an honor to stand on that stage as well, because mm -hmm. it's the National Arts Center, you know, mm -hmm. the name that says it all, right? Um, so when you're talking about venues, it could be, you know, the sound of some are better than the other, than others, like the Orpheum in Vancouver is... Mm -hmm. That's one of the most amazing rooms. You know, mm. you stand there and look up at that ceiling and kind of go mm. like, wow, this is a Very fantastic beautiful. old theater. Yeah. Uh, you know, those are some that come to mind. Uh, yeah, I love the you connection know, with your past. I mean, that's the thing that's so magical, I think, about talking to, you know, anybody you talk to. We all are inspired by other people watching other people and seeing other people and listening to other people and then when you get to you know what if you're lucky enough to experience playing at a venue where you saw many people play or make a record like to me uh you know the fact that I was making a record um with you guys at the bathhouse like that was an incredible experience and I was really thinking oh my God, what did the Stones do? Or what did the, you know, I'm now doing what my heroes did. And exactly. there's something really amazing about that. And it's almost like, you know, I think that anybody you talk to who plays music would have that same feeling that they're kind of, that they're a fan first. And then they be, they still can go back in time to that feeling of enthusiasm and, and, childlike kind of inspiration and, yeah I'm, you know i mean i you know i think i heard paul mccartney saying in in an interview uh on one of the tv shows where they're saying like you know i think it was stephen colbert asking him what's it like to be paul mccartney he said well you know right <laughs> there's that guy I, he said i still have that guy there's that kid from liverpool you know 
who really loved Buddy Holly, Elvis, and Little Richard, mm-hmm. that that guy's still in here, you know? Yeah. And yeah. and I kind of feel that way too. Like I feel, you know, even though I've got to meet, you know, so many of the people I've played on the same stage, you know, we we you know, we played with the Stones, we played with we opened for Simon and Garfunkel at the Sky Dome one time. We played wow. with the Everly Brothers in Ottawa at Lansdowne Park. Hmm. Uh, these are all people that I, growing up, I could never have imagined that I'd ever share a stage with, you yeah. know what I mean? So part of me is there's the professional musician who goes, yeah, well, you know, this is my job, mm-hmm. but there's the other part that's that, that 16 year old fan is still yeah. in there too, going like, I cannot believe what I'm doing right now. You know what I mean? I can't believe I'm standing here on the stage of Live 8 while Gordon Lightfoot and Neil Young are standing on either side of me chatting with each other. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, it's amazing. Did I ever think that would ever happen? <laughs> or being at Massey Hall and they come out not, and present us with a plaque to say, other than Gordon Lightfoot, you guys have played here the most. Hmm. Right? Because we've That's played amazing. there, I think it's 33 times. Holy right? moly. Yeah. Now, compared to Lightfoot, who's played there, I think, 121 <laughs> or something like that. Yeah, you guys have a long way to go. <laughs> yeah. But he he used to do three weeks at a time. Oh, right? man. Like, he would do yeah. the month of November. <laughs> That's great. At the peak of his career, he could do, you know, 17 nights in a row. Mm-hmm. So he's definitely got a speed. But next to him, we are the next. We've mm-hmm. played there 33 times. Nobody else has played there that many times. So, you know, that, that feels pretty special for your hometown, you know? Yeah. And, and like I said, you know, it's kind of become, it's almost like a church for me, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and they're going to renov- they're renovating it. And I wonder, you know, I think even though it's probably going to be more livable or more convenient or whatever it is, but there's something about the backstage there. It's so weird <laughs> and, and yeah. kind of like a rabbit warren. Like it's very bizarre back there. And, um, cause I've only played there with singing with Jim Cuddy. When you guys played there on a Valentine's day, I got to sing harmony and I've did a Ron Sexsmith tribute and I did a few things, but of course, you know, more just like a, a session person almost, but it, it's such a funny, funny place. Oh, it's, it's not very glamorous, <laughs> which is so no, great. No. It's so great. Well, and you know, it, it does, it is a little worrisome what it's, what's going to become of it, you know, because I, Greg said something that he took a lot of heat for uh, when they decided they were going to fix it up. He he said, and they asked him about it in the paper, and he said, why would you fix something that's perfect? Mm, that's <laughs> and everyone went like, oh, come on, it needs more washrooms, it needs, you know, but to some way, in some way, I agree with him, you know, you have this well, building Greg that's, is that, you know, Yeah, and Greg is like that guy who will, who loves the rough edges. You yeah. Know, he loves, like, he loves old. Don't tamper things. with it. Yeah, I love and that's what's so and you're like that too you know yeah i i'm i feel the kind of the same way now like there are things there are definitely improvements that could could be made but Mm -hmm. if you're when you start changing the building yeah then you're in trouble you know because i went to one of the meetings because they they offered us to come with input right Mm-hmm. So I went to one of the meetings and they said, well, we're thinking on taking out the middle aisle to put more seats in. And I was like, no, don't do yeah. that. You know? Yeah. Cause on a great show, people get up and they run down that aisle to dance at the front of the stage. They said, well, we don't want that. <laughs> and I, and I, I remember thinking like, you're going to ruin the hall, yeah. you know, yeah. you're going to ruin the place. Uh, and I hope, I don't know what they, you know, I really hope they Who don't knows? do that. Yeah. But that was one of their ideas, and I didn't, I didn't think that. And Jim was with me. He was going like, "Oh yeah, don't no, don't do that." You know, like mm-hmm. whatever you do, keep the center aisle. He said that's yeah. a gathering spot. Mm-hmm. You know, so 
but who knows what they're going to do. I really, you know, I really liked it when they decided to serve beer and let people bring it to the seats because mm -hmm. it made it more exciting. Yeah. When people have a couple of drinks, they loosen up, they get right into it, you know. And it didn't seem so, it didn't seem like a classical performance anymore, you know, because I mean, the place is built for, you know, classical music, basically, right? And yeah, you know, you're sitting in this soft seat, and you know, you just kind of got to sit there and, you know, it's and quiet. And, you, yeah, and behave. Well, once the beer came into the picture, you didn't have to behave anymore. <laughs> so I like that change. <laughs> That's good. Especially from the, you know, from the point of view of the band. Yeah. You feel a lot better when the people are like responding to you, you know? For sure. Um, we're, we could talk for probably three hours. So I'm going to, I'm going to try to get this podcast is about making of Sleepy Little Sailor, but I actually mostly what I love to talk about is the people that I'm <laughs> interviewing, not necessarily <laughs> about the album, but I do want to talk a little bit about the album because by the time we were recording that, I, this was, you know, that was my second kind of real studio experience, but you had already been playing music, what, for like 30 years already professionally. And yeah. so did you, I mean, I was kind of green, but what was your feeling about it? I mean, I know you have a really amazing memory, so I'm, I'm sure you have strong memories of it, but you know, were you feeling like, oh, just another album or... What oh, absolutely like? not. No, like, first of all, you know, when I, when I met Jim and Greg, you know, I, was, I had been playing a long time with a lot of great musicians, you know, and, and with Jim and Greg, they were more rudimentary. They, you know, they didn't really focus so much on being proficient on their instruments mm -hmm. as much as they, they uh, focused on writing. And when I met you, my added, I remember first hearing you and hearing your songs. And I just thought, like, I guess one thing I've always had a good ear for is writers, like a great writer. You know, like I'm a huge Randy Newman fan. You know what I mean? Writers always, you know, that was the start of it all. That was, so people would even say to me in the early days with Jim and Greg, like, you know, hey, you can play guitar better than those guys. Like, you know, I said, yeah, but listen to the writing. Their songs are good songs. They know how to write songs. And all the great musicians around town that I knew weren't really great writers. Hmm. Some of them could write a bit, you know. They'd write songs that were passable, but they weren't great songs. But I knew that they wrote great songs. And when I met you, I felt the exact same way. I felt like this girl really knows how to write because I looked, I read your lyrics. I listened to them and I was like, I was blown away right away. Thank you. I was like, this is special. You know, these, you know, I always right from the get go. Like when we recorded Johnstown, I felt that way. I thought like, listen to these songs, man. They're all great songs, you know? And I mean, to be honest with you, those songs that I was the least convinced of, was the songs that I wrote with you. <laughs> That's you know? crazy. Because I would I kind of think, like, are they up to scratch with her other songs? Because I think of, like, the Cherry Song or or You'll Always Be My Baby or or Johnstown for, you know. And I think, like, well, those songs are better than the ones I wrote, you know. Uh, and I it was a little sheepish at first of to, you know, to approach you on that level because I thought, like, she doesn't need my help, you know, and I didn't ever look at it. I just thought like when you, when I asked you to write that melody, I didn't, I didn't expect you to record the song yourself if you didn't want to. I just kind mm -hmm. of thought, well, maybe she'll write the song with me and it'll, it'll just be there, you know, right. and we'll have written a song together. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like, I didn't want to make you feel pressured. Like, Hey, now we wrote a song together. You better put it on your record. You know what I mean? But when you chose to do that, I was thrilled and honored, of course, right? But I I was already blown away by your writing for quite some time. Like, basically from the first day I met you at TED's when you came in and sang like three or four songs with us. Mm 
Mm-hmm. I don't know if you remember that night, but I was playing with David Baxter and Michelle, well, Bodan right. at the yeah. time. You came in and you had just gotten off the plane and Baxter got you up to, with your guitar and we backed you up on a couple of songs. You said, I remember you going A minor. This one's an A minor. And you started playing A minor. <laughs> and by the end of doing those four songs, I was, I was really impressed. And then, you know, you said, well, do you want to play with me at Harborfront? And I was like, yeah. And you gave me some songs to learn. And as I was listening to these songs, I'm kind of going like, whoa, these are like killer songs. Uh, So I immediately thought like, you know, Jim and Greg were two of the writers that I had met that I was really, you know, David Baxter was another guy because he, when I was in the Sharks, he wrote a lot of the songs and he was a good Mm -hmm. writer, but I didn't know a lot of great writers. And you were probably maybe, you know, the, you know, the first female I had worked with who wrote that, who was a great writer, like, mm. you know, I had, Thank you. I had never really worked with anyone else who, you know, could tell a story like the way you could. And I felt like I would get right inside that story. So when it came time to go and record Sleepy Little Sailor, I was really excited about it because first of all, there was going to be not just one, but I think there is, you know, two songs of mine in the mix by that time. Right. Yeah. I think that. Yeah. And, uh, and we even did and, actually, we did Billy too, but we, we saved it for the next record. That's right. So we did three of your songs, three of our collaborations. That's, yeah. So that to me, uh, was very special, but once again, I didn't know if my, I didn't know if, if my songs were up to scratch with yours, because I always felt like, you know, yours were so complete and the story, you know, I always got like vignettes in my head when I would Mm -hmm. listen to your songs, right? Because I could see the characters in the song and I could see them in a room and in a setting and that, and I always thought like, that's such an amazing gift to be able, you know, it's like reading a great novel where, the person, the the writer can sit you in the room that that it's taken place in, and whatever your imagination allows you, you you picture the couch, you picture the coffee table, you picture the the painting on the wall. You know that your songs could do that. There's that's rare. You know, there's not a lot of people who are that good, and you're one of them. So Aww, I was thrilled to be sad. making a record with you. I mean, you might have felt you were an inexperienced young person at the time, which recording-wise you were, of course, right? Because mm-hmm. you had only done a few recordings. Mm-hmm. But your writing, you know, which is the most important thing. I, I still, to this day, think, like, without the song, you know, you don't have much, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I've seen some... You know, in the years I've been playing with Blue Rodeo, I've seen some amazing musicians open for us and they didn't have great songs and they didn't go anywhere. You know, I don't want to mention any names, but some of the greatest musicians in Canada Hmm. have had bands opening for us and their songwriting wasn't there. Uh, The songwriting a lot of, with with really great musicians, I think the songwriting is an afterthought sometimes. Hmm. Like, oh, now we got these great musicians. Hey, we're going to have to get some songs, you know? Whereas with uh, great writers, the songs come first. And that's kind of the most important thing. Mm-hmm. Well, that's, I'm honored with, by your words. It makes me cry. Um, oh. You know what? We're almost well, at an hour, but I did want to ask you thank you so much for saying all that stuff. Um, I mean, that was when I was trying to, I was really trying to make it so vivid and I did a lot of visualization and I really wanted to see if I could transport myself into another zone. And that was a lot of times my method of like, okay, I'm going to try to visualize. I'm going to try to imagine. Um, and so that and I was, I would test it on myself. Like, can I feel like I'm going somewhere else? Um, and that's, to me, when I heard the melodies that you were writing, it was so easy to do that. 
the melody kind of brought me into this other zone and probably that's why it was so quick for me to write the lyrics to that song because it was so evocative and dreamy and it kind of sets the tone of the whole record like we didn't know it was going to be called sleepy little sailor we didn't know that was going to be the lead track or anything but it made perfect sense after listening to the whole collection of songs to have that be the one song that was it's like the first chapter right in the book Um, yes so Maybe just a couple, maybe just a one more question, because I like to keep these things under an hour. But um, maybe when, you know, there's, I have so many questions for you, and now I don't know what to ask. But maybe, you know, at that time, you were very, very experienced. And I've seen you work with a lot of younger, less experienced artists and I can tell that that's something that really inspires you and I think one time you said to me it's you know of course you were playing these grand venues and people were striking your gear and loading it for you and setting it up for you and yet I'm like can you go on tour with me and I'll pay you a hundred (laughs) dollars and (laughs) you gotta load your gear in at the end of the night up these stairs out and we might get our van broken into so we can't leave anything in the van so we have to load it twice out of the venue and then up the stairs to the hotel (laughs) there's no elevator sorry and uh but you never that was i mean you're lucky because you made this a living with blue rodeo but also you wanted to do those things and you always said it was much more somehow exciting and fun can you talk about that a little bit yeah well you know i always i never forgot what it was like on the way up with blue rodeo you know the early days when we were just a young band and we get you know our first gig opening for mid-jure in ottawa and we travel you know through a snowstorm for six hours seven hours to play a 30 minute set and then drive home again you know uh But we knew that we won the house over, you know, those times were exciting. And when I started doing those things with you and we would go to the UK and, you know, we would play over there and I would see the audience's response. I remember playing Dingwalls that night and, you know, seeing everybody like listening to you. And for me, that that kind of discovery, pe- watching people discover somebody great was so exciting, you know, and being a part of it really meant a lot to me because it's kind of, you know, once once I you know, got on the road with Blue Rodeo and, you know, you know that people have the albums and they know every song. They know exactly what's coming. They sing along, they're having a great time. It's all good and everything. But you already won them over when you walk on stage, you walk on stage, but when, Oh, you're bo- we- okay. Sorry. You cut out there. That was it. You, I missed what you said. The last sentence you've already run, won them over. Yeah. When, when you, as soon as you walk on stage with, you know, in that situation, you know, with blue rodeo, they're on your side. Yeah. You've got them because they know the records. They love you already. Whereas mm-hmm. when, you know, we would go out on tour in some small town like Nottingham or something like that, and these people are there and they're listening, and you can see them, they're not sure. And then by the end of the night, they're at the merch table buying the disc, and they're kind of going like, wow, that was fantastic. You know, something very rewarding to me in doing that and having that feeling of like, there was 105 people in the room tonight and they all went away fans. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? I, I found that incredibly exciting still. And there's, I don't know what, what it is in me, but there was something about starting, you know, doing, doing that was kind of more exciting in a way than walking on and having 2,000 people, you know, who already are there. Mm-hmm. You know, like winning over those people is kind of what, what was so much fun. 
and to watch them discover you and just to watch the whole thing happen, you know, to watch something come from, you know, nothing to, you know, okay, now there's 105 people in Nottingham who get it, you know, that was exciting to me. Uh, I yeah, really, and you, you know, kind of were my... there from the writing process to the recording process to the touring. And that's pretty cool as well that you saw the whole thing unfold. Exactly. Like uh, those, those UK tours that we did are, you know, I know they were tough and everything, but the memories of those really stick with me for some reason. I really love those times. Uh, I know that they were hard on us, but you know, you don't remember <laughs> the hard. Though. It was fun. I like, I, I really look back on them with so much fondness and go like, those were the, you know, they really were the good old days, you know? Yeah. I, just... I mean, it was, it was pretty interesting and we were very lucky to be able to have the whole band there and be, Oh yeah. You know, that was, and I knew that I was like, I'm so I was so used to playing on my own or just with a duo or a trio and then to have a full band tour with me that was really really incredible oh I hear some children or, or a yeah child. I just I've got to get my charger because my phone is running out of power so of I'm juice. just going to bring this in the room well we might wrap I might wrap it up even though I have one more I mean talking about the tour Right before, I'm going to do one last question. I mean, there, there's a lot of really nice comments that people are leaving. Um, somebody, you know, we did, okay, we are, Tracy Rowan wanted us to talk about our tour for the Sleepy Little Sailor. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And this will be our last question because otherwise we'll go on too long. But um, so we had this UK tour planned for, a full band tour for September 2001 um, for Sleepy Little Sailor release. I had been there in April of that year um, playing on my own. But then the fall was going to be like the full band and everything. And I was there in advance. I was in Germany and going to some places on my own. And then all of a sudden, September 11th uh, happened and the Twin Towers were hit. And it was it was all this crazy... Thing. nobody knew what was going on or who did this and it was very very traumatic and I there was a all these rumors that maybe there were going to be these copycat attacks and hijackings on flights to London and all my whole band was going to be flying into London so I called everybody I think about a week in advance saying look if you guys don't want to come I'm totally fine with that. I get it. You know, nobody knows what's happening. It's, there's all this fear and it might happen again. And, uh, and you know, if you feel afraid and you rather not come, that's fine. And I remember <laughs> calling you Basil and you being like, you had this warrior like attitude. You were saying, <laughs> I, you know, kind of like the, you didn't say these words, but this is what it was. It was like, I live for making music. And if I die doing it, then so be it. You're kind of like, that is a glorious demise kind of thing. <laughs> die on the touring. battlefield. Yeah. <laughs> and I just remember that. And I was like, Oh my God, this is so wonderful. <laughs> I love this. Well, I think, and... you know, there was, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I just, there was a feeling like, you know, they're not going to stop us from playing music. You know what I mean? That's, yeah. that's how I felt anyway. I was like, you know, because people said this was, we didn't even know who had done this or what the purpose exactly. was or anything. It was just out of the blue and crazy. Yeah. And that, you know, I mean, it is crazy still, but now there's all these sides and blocks and things, you know explanations but at the time it just seemed like this mysterious evil thing going on but right. i do remember you being like fuck that we're doing this <laughs> and we did it and we had this incredible time and i think that rawness and the danger of maybe traveling at that time added to our intensity and our dedication to it 
It was an interesting time, too, because, you know, it was before the invasion of Iraq, right? Mm -hmm. So the whole, you know, I remember being at the Celtic ruins with you and I think it was in the Lakeland or maybe it was in Wales and the American flag being draped over the, you know, they were, they were kind of like at the time, you know, they were with the U S they were kind of like on, you know, we stand was up by you, you know, like it, there was a real sense of pulling together and unity in that England was, you know, with, you know, we're with you. I remember people saying that, you know, and mm -hmm. it was, it felt like a dangerous time to be there, but it also felt really good. I remember, you know, watching the tribute in, from Glasgow, who is staying up with uh, Bob Packwood one night and we were watching TV and, you know, Bruce Springsteen was on singing my city of ruined. And, uh, you know, I remember thinking like, wow, you know, just, it was, too unreal to fathom because that's like by that time all of the information started to come out and every time you turned on the tv you saw that same footage of the towers falling and everything and mm -hmm. it was a it was a very wartime like feel you know what mm -hmm. i mean and and i think that there's there's something about there's you know it was a horrible thing but i think that those horrible things bring the people that are still there together and make them, people were being nice to each other, you know? Mm -hmm. Like I even remember being in New York City just after that, like after I left you and went home, Blue Rodeo had a gig in New York City. And I just remember being on the street, uh, Bob and I went, walked down to see the ruins, Bob, Bob Egan. And, uh, and there, we were in a Starbucks and there was somebody had taken the wrong coffee that came up on the counter. And, you know, in typical New York fashion, this guy was going to fight over it. And finally, he, you know, he was like, he was kind of going to go, hey, that's my coffee. And he kind of just gives it to this other person. And he goes to her like, here, it's OK. You have a good day and be safe, you know. And I thought, wow, like. You can you could sense this thing in New York that everyone had that feeling of we all got to look after each other, you mm -hmm. know. So it was a very inspiring time, I think. And for us to be on the road uh, at the time, it, there felt like a real camaraderie. I, I I remember feeling like, and I look back on that time now, like I said, and I just it's like with the fondest of memories, you know. I think, mm -hmm. wow, wasn't that great, you know? It was. So we great. had so much fun yeah. and we laughed a lot too. Like yeah. there was, got a, we had some great laughs on that tour. We laughed a lot and we played so intensely. I love the contrast of the seriousness of our gigs with mixed with the goofiness of, especially Joel, <laughs> you know, so. Oh, I'll never forget it. Being in Liverpool and going up Matthew Street and doing our Beatle geek out, you know? Yeah. Are you making fun of us? <laughs> <laughs> I was making fun of you, but I was also enjoying it too. I had to make fun of you guys, the old dudes with their tribute. The old you know, dudes, all beetle dudes, freaks. Yeah. The old goof, goofy dudes, <laughs> the jaded guys who are suddenly like, like kids again, you know? Well, no, I remember... Was, I remember you saying one interesting thing and like, you know, this, this struck me the difference between us guys who were like goofy and geeking out over the Beatles. And that night in Chester, we were playing on stage and you said something to the effect of like, you know, we were in Liverpool this morning and these guys were all geeking out on the Beatles. And you said, but I found out a lot of history today. And I found out that, Liverpool was the was like the start of the slave trade, right? Mm. Like that's what struck you, which to me was kind of like seemed much more serious and highbrow <laughs> <laughs> than us just yeah. geeking out over the Beatles. You yeah, know? I was probably like, reading all the plaques, trying to gather <laughs> stories. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting, amazing. Well, thank you so much, Baz, for this conversation. I mean, oh man, we could go on for days. Yeah. 
And you know? thanks to everybody who joined us. There's Elliot Brood is saying hi to us and oh. people are enjoying the conversations and we love that you're listening to us and you can share our share this with people as well because it's just going to be up there as long as the world is still with us. And I, and the other thing about right now I'm you know this idea of adversity and coming together. I really feel like right now that is happening as well, even though there's a lot of trouble in the world. It feels like people are there are parallels kind. for sure. Yeah. So I agree. We appreciate all the folks who are here hanging out with us tonight. So absolutely. And, yeah. Thank you, Basil. Thanks for all Thank your you. wonderful playing and stories. And, you know, we've got a new song that we're recording right now so it's it's kind of all full circle so that's fantastic yeah. yeah uh you know it's been an honor to play with you Susie uh out of my career of all the people that I've played with you are one of the brightest shining lights ever like you're you're a writer that I have 100% total respect for so it's been my pleasure to play with you Thank you so much. Okay, now we end in tears. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> okay, much love. And All right. I'm going to end the broadcast. I'm going to click this button. And thank you so much. Bye. Love you, Basil. My pleasure. Love you too, Susie. Ciao. Ciao.